Thank you, Jörka. So good. Up. Yeah. I'm just going to go back. So my name's Alan Painter, and uh, I've been coming to XML Prague for a long time. And O'Neill just reminded me in the break, he said, uh, you've been coming here for a long time. I think it's the first time I've ever seen you present something. So it is the first time I've presented something. Um, so one thing is that uh, I've been thinking about this presentation now, I think, for about 15 years. So I finally got around to it. I hope it's a good one. I did present it to Markup uh, UK, and I was told, oh, it was a very bad presentation. And so I was really excited when I was able to change it and that uh, XML Prague accepted it. This is definitely XML Prague is my first love. Uh-oh, and so that is not good. All right, let's see if we can get that. It's funny, it was working before. All right, that's the family. And that's not good. Okay. All right. I may have to present it for this. I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. All right. Is it Windows machine? No. Is it Windows machine? No, it was working fine just before. <laughs> Just you need to switch the primary and secondary. That's right. All right. Machine. Let me see. This way. It must be off this guy. I have to do it. I, have to do it. I don't do this very much. Is this Windows or Mac? It's a Mac. Oh, I cannot talk to this Mac. All right. Who can tell me how to switch my primary and, and command F1? Command F1. Thank you. All right. Let's see. If that's gonna work. Let's try it one more time. There we go. Thank you very much. OK. All right. Just try to go to the next page, maybe. Let's try one more. This is really strange, because this has never happened. All right. You have to pardon me. We're just going to have to present from this. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. I hope it's big enough. OK. So we won't have quite the same animation either. OK. <laughs> so, so I'm talking about domain-specific languages in spreadsheets. So domain-specific languages, what are they good for? Well, actually, what do they look like? So I've got some examples up here. I think these are some very common examples. We have uh, make and yak and trough and HTML. Yak used to be on everybody's CV. I'm not sure if it is anymore. And what we can see from these domain-specific languages is that we have, uh, there's two main things about them, is that they have a syntax. And that syntax means something. It has some meaning. And that uh, the implementation also does something. So make is going to generate, it's going to generate different artifacts. This one's going to generate an application. My HTML. It's going to be read by a browser. It's going to generate a user interface. And I can see, I can understand from it, OK, so I've got a list of, uh, un unnumbered list of things, and I have some things in it that I'm going to present it. So I've, get, I've got some meaning from it, and I also get an Im implementation of it. So that's what the, the promise is of domain-specific languages. So uh, domain-specific languages, in this case, these were standard sort of technical ones. It's very common to have domain-specific languages for describing something in more of an application domain. Uh, and so there was uh, October of 2018, there was a, a conference, ACM, on models. These are mod domain-specific models. There was a survey of some of the domain-specific languages. Uh, and so they mentioned things like uh, voice control systems for home automation or military radio systems or touchscreen controllers. So I think we can agree that these are very domain-specific areas, OK? So um, they were using that. And it, one of the things that they mentioned was that uh, a DSL could be uh, developed in a couple of days or maybe as many as three weeks. And one thing they men mentioned was that three weeks, that was for the novice. So there were people that were used to doing this regularly. They could do it very quickly. So there's not that much effort in putting it in. So there's not much effort. We can do it. What's utility? So. Um, Martin Fowler, in his famous book, uh, Domain-Specific Languages, from 2010, it's a big book, very expensive. Uh, I didn't buy it. Um, 
he said that he thought the hardest part of software development was the communication and that domain specific languages were good for communication because they gave you a way of just of uh, manipulating these business domains. Okay, so that same Martin Fowler, they're supposed to be animated as a second one. He also said in 2014, and this is in a blog post, he says, XML is terrible for programming language and that uh, the great example of this is XSLT, which is awful to work with. No language can be good that makes a subroutine call so painful. Now, I don't know why, I, I actually, I frankly don't understand what he means. But uh, uh, apparently he is an XQuery guy. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So this is supposed to be animated. But let me try to animate this for you a little bit. This is, now I wanted to ask you, how many people work with business analysts here? One, we can commiserate at the coffee break. <laughs> and. Uh, going to ask to be the business uh, ambassador to XML Prague. And so I do feel like I bring some diversity because I come from business instead of the humanities or tech publishing or anything like that. So um, we, we, uh, we're looking at the, uh, the object of our desire is this guy. This is the business analyst, okay? And he's the one who's going to write a business specification in a, in a uh, typical process. And that business specification is going to go over to the technical implementer or, or the implementation team. So the technical implementation team is going to interpret this. So they do a first interpretation and maybe they'll talk with the business owners and have some things uh, get um, uh, corrected or whatever. But then ultimately, they are going, I'm having a lot of technical problems. Up. Oh, that's good. All right, thank you. So the technical implementer is going to have to interpret it and produce a technical implementation. So at this point, we already have a problem because we have a specification, which is a description of how things should work, and we have an implementation, which is a description, which, which is the implementation of how it should work, and they can start diverging. So one of the things that happens is that once QA picks it up and finds some problems, they'll go back to the implementation people usually, and they'll <laughs> And it will fix that. <laughs> Should I just hold it? That'd be better. Different one than this is the third one. So we can give it a try.
Good. Now I feel like Tom Jones. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So now, so they're working on a common support. So this is a common image of the model, and they're working on it together, and uh, in harmony. And uh, this way, there's not going to be anything divergent. Now, the technical implementer also needs to develop these things that are going to extract the meaning from the, the, the DSL that they've designed together and is going to generate the implementation from it. But we're sure that the implementation is the faithful representation of the specification. So this is what we're shooting for, is making this uh, development process much cleaner through this common uh, domain-specific language. Uh, and then one of the things is that the quality assurance person is going to, uh, any problems that uh, this person shows, uh, uh, comes up with, they're going to get corrected in the DSL. So we won't have any cases of divergence. Okay. So that's what we're shooting for, but actually there's better. Because one of the big things is that the, our business analyst is coming up with these business rules initially, and he's going to have to, uh, or he, that, that person is going to, uh, if he's writing the business rules and just passing it off to an implementation team, well, the quality of what the business analyst provides is not necessarily all that good, and that's okay, because the implementation team, they always take up the slack. So they usually, they usually complete it, and they'll add, uh, they'll, they'll have a better, as they're going through the technical analysis, they'll determine what really needs to be done here. Uh, but in this case, our business analyst can produce the implementation himself, and because the implementation is available, then we can test it. And so the, the implementation team will have uh, provided a test har harness such that our business analyst is able to uh, confirm the test immediately. So he has an immediate feedback on the quality of his, uh, of his specification. So that's what we're really shooting for, is, is we want the business analyst to be almost autonomous and also have a quality check. All right, so it's a business analyst, and business analysts love spreadsheets. So let me ask another question. Who here uses spreadsheets? Yeah? Any, anybody never use spreadsheets? Never? Okay. <laughs> All right, so spreadsheets. The, the business analysts, they love spreadsheets because, you know, everything is square, and I can line up the columns, and the editing model is good. I can copy and paste uh, uh, whole, whole lines, whole columns. Uh, a whole worksheet, uh, and I can, I can really pimp my specification. You know, I can put these colors and fonts and styles, so I can really make it, it's really me, you know. So, so this is what's really good about, uh, about spreadsheets, is that I, there's a lot of uh, capabilities with them uh, for, for, uh, for presentation. So um, what we're shooting for, and so here's, here's the takeaway. That if we say, okay, DSLs are useful, and that DSLs make our business process better, and that business analysts can use the DSLs to be direct contributors rather than sort of indirect uh, without any quality uh, check on their work, and that also business analysts prefer to work with spreadsheets, so it, it is uh, directly a consequence that we should use spreadsheets for DSLs, and we should probably use DSLs as well. But then the next part is that we're, go we're going to have XML technologies that can read these spreadsheets very easily. So we're good at XML technologies. We're here together for that. Uh, I've just learned that that means we use XPL or XPDLs, uh, XPDs for that. So, so this is any XPath derived language. And we can also, we can produce almost any artifact with that. So we've got a good toolkit for it. So this is a good reason for using XML technologies for implementing DSLs and spreadsheets. So that's the takeaway. Uh, is everybody convinced? <laughs> okay. XPDSL. Okay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. So uh, I will go a little bit more into uh, how maybe you can do this. And so this is sort of I, uh, this is sort of my XML success story. Different things that I've put into place, and, and I hope you agree that they're successes. But they uh, they have been put into production. They were used. Uh, they were, they were used in successful projects, so I think they're objectively success stories. So why do we say that XML technologies are, are good at reading uh, 
uh, spreadsheet documents, well, the spreadsheet documents from any of the popular spreadsheet applications, they're already in XML. So sometimes they're in archive files with XML, but we can read that pretty easily from the XPath. And uh, otherwise, we, we, uh, there's even a 2003 document uh, that's produced by Microsoft uh, that's in a single XML page. And so you can use any of these, and it's pretty easy to read and to write something that can read these different formats. So I'm not going to talk too much about writing these, but uh, I've got a, a couple of implementations for the first one that does, it's about 100 lines of XSLT, and the second one's about 200 lines. Okay. And there's uh, other people that have talked about this in other, in other uh, venues. But um, I don't really want to use directly what's in uh, the spreadsheet documents uh, as they are. I want to use a simple, mo simple model. So my simple model says, uh, and so this is where Hans Jürgen, he told me yesterday, this is the constrained tree model. And he also told me there's a German word just for that, a single German word, and that we're just going to have information. So we've got here uh, two worksheets, and so they each have a name. And so that's the only thing that I can put into my worksheets is that I've got uh, a name attribute for it. And the only other spot that I have any content is within the cells themselves. So I can address any worksheets by name, and then a worksheet is a set of lines, and those lines are sets of cells, and the cells have the information. So that's a very simple model. So what we want to do is we want to read the uh, XML. We want to read what uh, is in uh, the XML files uh, in either the archives or in the, the spreadsheet document, and we want to convert it into this format. And so any of the examples are going to be based on this format. All right, so we're going to, uh, we've got, uh, I've got a couple of examples. I just want to show how some things I put in uh, typically in order to have some information that I can pull out of uh, the DSL. Okay, so for instance, I'll typically I'll say, okay, I'm going to have one column. So th in this case, it's a column A, it's column one that we'll use as, uh, in order to put some keywords in there that I can pick up easily. So here, uh, I wanted to put, I'm gonna generate a Java class, and so I wanna put the package, so that's the, sort of the path uh, it, it, that's gonna be used in the declaration within the Java, but also where it goes in the file system. Uh, I'm gonna put that into column B. So I've got a, a little function for saying, okay, give me the line that has in column A, has a package, give me the value in, in column B. So that's very simple. Uh, I've got things like, uh, these are supposed to be states in a state machine. So there are five of the states. What I want to do is I want to pick up everything that's in the cells that are greater than position two. So not to, to go very much farther into this, but it, it shows that it's pretty easy to extract information from this format. Okay, so it, I think it's even trivial. All right, so I just want to go into a couple of use cases. So here's a use case. I just want, so I want to know, does everyone recognize this? Huh? Does, uh, as a finite state machine, is everyone familiar with this? Do I, should I go into this? Um, okay, maybe I should go into this, okay. <laughs> you can't read it, is that what it is? <laughs> uh, what can I do? You're seeing how bad I am on the right side. Is this it? That's the best I can do. Okay, it's not too bad. All right, so this is a finite state machine. So what I have is I've got my states. So this is, this is supposed to be a vending machine in the United States. We've got nickels and dimes and quarters in the United States. That's 5, 10, and 25 cents. If you put 25 cents in, you get candy out. So that's the action, dispense candy. You need to get to 25 cents before it dispense candy. And if you hit the coin return button, it returns the coins. So this is a very common way of describing this because uh, from a given state, an action, uh, sorry, an event comes in. So the event's a nickel, that's five cents. So if I start off from, well, I can see from the start state, if I get a nickel, I go to five cents. From States, if I get a nickel, my state transition is to 10 cents. So it's, it's pretty simple, it's a pretty common thing to do. The other thing is to have your action. So you don't always have an action. If it's blank, that means we don't do anything because we're just counting the money until we get up to 25. And then 
when uh, I do get to 25, then the action is dispense candy, unless I hit the coin return first. And so that's my action. I want to hit coin return. Okay. So um, this is one. I've, I've used this not for this particular automaton, but I've had some very co complicated automatons. And so I've ended up using Excel for this. Um, so I'm, this is more uh, 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 an example of, um, of how you could generate something like a Java class. It's, it's probably not the most compelling one. Uh, so I'm going to generate an abstract Java class. So what's interesting is that I've got the information about the events. I can put that into an enumeration. I can put that into the information into a state. Uh, I'm generating the state tables. Uh, now we're generating uh, a no-op. So that means that's an operation that doesn't do anything. So those blank, where there was blank uh, for the actions, I'll put the no op in there. And then we're also generating, so these are all the states from the table, the state transitions. Uh, and so from these, uh, from these arrays, I can say, okay, when I have a current state and I've got a new event, wow, okay. I will go to my next state. And I've got a little method for doing that, okay. So we can generate that and I can use it uh, I can derive it and, and generate a, a class that uses it. I can also generate something for GraphViz. This is in order to generate this graphic using GraphViz. Okay. So that's a couple of things, a couple of artifacts I've generated with that. So that's not the most compelling. So I'm going to skip this one. I'll just, this is one for generating different configurations for applications. All right. Now this, this one is one that I worked on about uh, six years ago. Still being used today, there, there's still some business analysts that are keeping this alive and working on it. They're changing it every couple of days uh, in production. Uh, uh, we've got uh, different types of, of uh, documents that are coming in that correspond to different instruments. So this is, this is for the bank, different financial instruments. They each have a different content model. What I wanted to do is I want to extract some CSV information, or what uh, Hans Jürgen said, this is a normalized uh, entity. <laughs> so we want to extract normalized entity from our structure content. And we want to extract some number of them. We don't know how many uh, until the instrument comes in. And the rules are different. Uh, so today, w what we're doing is, is we have something where we say, OK, we've got a document that comes in. We want to extract 85 different columns of data. And it's the same data from everything, but the rules for getting it are a little bit different for each one. All right, so the, sort of the simple D DSL for this one is it looks like uh, part of XSLT. We've got, I've got a for each that says, OK, this is how many things I'm going to generate. So I'm going to generate one line for every trade capture report that I have in here. Uh, and I'm also going to set a couple of variables. And then finally, I'm going to get to the column extractions. And the rules for these column extractions are obviously in the context of the trade capture report. And so I'm going to get, for each, separate uh, for each separate trade there, whatever the currency is for that trade, the last quantity. And then the book, it comes from something else. It comes from the trade leg. So here I've, I've given you know, a very succinct uh, description of, of what it looks like. Um, I'm going to generate an XSLT template. It looks like this. So it's got a name. So this is where I'm going to be recognizing a fixed ML bond. I've got an XPath default namespace that's very useful. And so all those rules for the columns, they're down in here for generating the CSV. And down here, we're going to encode the CSV for generating it. And so the basic mechanism says then that what I want to do is generate a series of templates. So that was one template for one type of content. I want to generate a series of templates. And I Try each, when, a, when I've got a new document that comes in, I'll try each template in order in order to determine whether or not that template knows about it. And if it does know about it, then if it is the right template for that uh, content type, we will generate a result line or several result lines. That's our output. We'll stop there. Otherwise, we'll keep going. So what does that look like? So this is something that the business analysts would keep, uh, keep up. They would declare their namespaces. They would set. This is uh, going to generate the, the XSLT template for the FixML bond. That's going to generate the XSLT template for the FPML bond. Um, it's, uh, each of them has their own default prefix. And so when I put an XPath in here, I don't have to put the prefixes in. I can. It makes it a little bit easier to read it if I don't. And um, 
I've also got a, a forward mechanism that's going to forward off. This is, if I have a very, uh, a very small difference between these two, I can, I can forward off to these systems that are slightly different based upon pattern matching here. All right. So business analysts, they, 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 uh, they use this. They, they actually, they own it. I think they enjoy using it. Um, it makes that uh, there's actually not even uh, normally IT people involved in the definition of it. So it's, it's made that short cycle very obvious. All right, so I had another case. This is a case that got me involved in it uh, in XML originally. This is the case where I had uh, a schema in the front office, schema in the back office, the documents needed to be converted between the two, and there were different subject matter expert teams for each of them. So I'm just going to go this, through this very quickly. Uh, we wanted to generate, this is schema where XSLT, we wanted to use the types for strong matching, uh, and we were using, so we're using uh, a template for describing those. So we've got these types. Uh, where we're saying, okay, here's, here's the type I'm producing, here's the type it's coming from. These directly inform the XSLT templates. I also had transcodification, where you say, okay, in the front end type, there's this type of code, the back end type is that type. And then uh, they could also write their own XPath rules. So this is something the business analyst used. We developed right away, the business analyst used just out of the box. And so the whole system was based around it, and it was very successful. We, got in, uh, we finished up the project very quickly. We started taking on a lot of extra work around it because it was shown to be a very good method. So one of the things is the subject matter experts, they would take the same support, and they would put a column in there to say, OK, have we validated on a very fine-grained level all of those different rules? And so the subject matter experts themselves were using the same support for that. All right, just maybe some conclusions. DSL representation, I think, is very useful. Uh, I've got a couple of cases where it's been, it's been uh, more than satisfactory. Uh, BAs, they, they actually, they mostly like to work with it. Sometimes there are some recalcitrant ones, but mostly they do enjoy. Uh, the development time is not that important. It's easy to go. And you, the big part is designing it. So that requires creativity. That's, so that's where, and it also requires that you have somebody on your team that's enthusiastic. So uh, if you have Martin Fowler on this team, probably it won't work. Um, so I, there was one question, what can't you put into a DSL in a spreadsheet? And uh, if you ask Martin Fowler, there's probably one thing. Uh, I have a conjecture that any functional process can be represented as a DSL in a spreadsheet. And the only provision is that the implementer needs to be clever enough. All right, so two caveats, spreadsheets, you put it into Git, you're not gonna merge two branches out of the box with Git, it won't work. And the other thing is you aren't gonna be able to look at the differences between successes. You probably have to buy something from Delta XML in order to do that, so. All right, thank you. Thank you, we, we lose one microphone each, each 15 minutes here. So um, thank you very much because it was difficult with the technical problems. So any questions? Because it seems to be two. Hello. Yes. Uh, Liam Quinn, Delightful Computing. Hello. So uh, Betty Harvey gave an interesting paper at ba the Balassage Conference last year about um, using using Excel spreadsheets to communicate XML analysis, it was called. And I, didn't, I don't remember if you were there or if you were familiar with that, but it's one for you to look I at. I did read it. Okay, um, yeah. And I thought that there was a, there was a clear connection. We're, I, I don't know if we're really, we're not, probably not aiming for the exact same usage, but uh, I did, when I read that, I thought, uh-oh, she's already got my paper. And then I read her paper and I said, okay, I, I just maybe still some space for mine, so. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I was reminded by your talk of a project I once did with a, with a client where we implemented a domain-specific language for extracting data from spreadsheets into XML. So uh, it was a little language that you wrote in a spreadsheet to describe a spreadsheet and describe its mapping to XML. 
and it generated XSLT to extract the data from the spreadsheet into XML. It was a very handy little, little tool, but never productized. So I think one of the reviews said, this is not a novel approach. Uh, and I agree, uh, but I think that's one of the wonderful things is that we already have this toolbox and we understand how it works. I just wanted to try to connect the dots about these processes, maybe generate some ideas. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.